from the Book of Recollections, a compilation of stories, remembrances, and half-truths collected from dead spirits in the queue at the gates of Latherna. I remember. I remember. I remember. I remember a whiskey I had, clear and bright as honey, tasted of earth, with a chase of spice behind it that prickled in my throat as I drew my breath. It wasn't like the whiskey we had back home in... Back home in... Back home in Capot Bay, that's where I'm from, Capot Bay. Or East Fair. One of those. But that's not what I was when I had this whiskey. I was at an inn, at a grand old inn, and there were all these little bells ringing. Sometimes a much larger bell as well. Bong! Bong! And I had this lovely whiskey at the bar, and it was clear and bright as honey. I was very sad, I remember, but I don't recall why. That's funny, isn't it? Don't recall why. If you follow the ashen path out from Dead Man's Cross, you will find the House of Black Lanterns. There, if you're willing to wager that which you cannot imagine losing, you stand to win the very stuff of dreams. Of course, if the tables don't suit your interest, the house also offers some of the finest dining, entertainment, and lodging in all the Shadowfell, thanks to the efforts of its unparalleled, if eccentric, staff. Welcome to the Chimera, a role-playing adventure podcast. Our current game is the House of Black Lanterns, which takes place in the venerable campaign setting of Greyhawk, but kind of off to the side of it, and which we play using Simple World by Avery Alder, a pared-down version of Apocalypse World built to allow players to easily create their own Powered by the Apocalypse hacks. I'm Vin LeBate, and I'll be playing Lizzie, the bartender. Joining me this week are Jeffrey Bard as Pix the Bellhop, Casey Smith as Elodia, the Entertainer, and Kelly Wiseman Aspruth Jackson, the Game Master. Now, let's get started. Okay, well, um, I guess we're assembled so we can get started. So, uh, I also have, I started, but have not finished re-listening to that episode, but I think I have what I need in the immediate sense. If there's something that someone remembers that I have missed that we discussed previously, feel free to point it out. If I'm not, if I appear to have forgotten it, I probably have. <laughs> so based on my recollection of that conversation and the part of it that I re-listened to and what's been in the Slack, we have... A concept of a setting. We have some characters. I have some other characters to sort of throw into the mix. Maybe a few things to do. But I wouldn't so much say that I have like... I I think that my understanding of this is that it's more of a collective storytelling project than just... Um, Kelly Bryan things. Devising yeah. A, yeah, a carefully plotted narrative that your characters fit intricately into, right? We're sort of figuring out... What is this game as we go along? So basically, I have a colander full of spaghetti, <laughs> and I'm going to throw it at the wall, uh, and hopefully, eventually, something will stick. But I'm depending on you we all. We got some sauce, right? To be like, I don't know, maybe just be like the grippy wall, like try and hold on to the spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe what I'm trying to say. I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna sort of explore it together. What what is a game in the House of Black Lanterns like? What what does life in the House of Black Lanterns look like? We're sort of going to figure that out as we go along. Sound good? Sounds good. Sounds amazing. Okay, so as a reminder for myself as much as anybody else, the sort of narrative benchmarks that we established about the House of Black Lanterns are well, the House of Black Lanterns is a location in the Shadowfell and of the Shadowfell. Yet it can be found in many different places in the natural world and across the plains at different times. Two, the House of Black Lanterns is a place of respite and recreation. All manner of entertainment, libation, and public accommodation may be found within. Three, the House of Black Lanterns is cosmopolitan in its appearance and design. 
It reflects no one culture or society perfectly. Four, the House of Black Lanterns has a large staff, but only ever a single proprietor. Its ownership has changed many times. Five, the House of Black Lanterns is called such because its entrances and grounds are decorated with black lanterns, casting a violet light. It has a large bell, which tolls whenever it departs or arrives. Six, the House of Black Lanterns is always connected to a place called Dead Man's Cross by an ashen path. This does not change, even as the rest of the structure moves. And seven, whatever one could need or want, it is possible, with sufficient risk and luck, to gain it at the House of Black Lanterns. Whatever one could fear to lose, it is possible to part with at the House of Black Lanterns. All right. So, Jeff, this is definitely, uh, of the three people, of the three players in the circle right now, your character's uh, bailiwick more than any other. So what do you think the lobby of the House of Black Lanterns looks like? Man, so um, the way I've always pictured it is like, one of two things. I either picture it as this super, like, incredibly austere, old, gilded place, or as this sort of almost homey, like, dark, everything is leather bound, there's carpet, not tile, everything's a little bit hushed, um, the sound gets absorbed really well by the walls. And it's got this sort of like velveteen, dark red, dark brown kind of motif going on. Um, I haven't decided which one I like feel is the one, um, but but those are the two ways I've always pictured it. Um, it's either like going to the Bellagio in Las Vegas, or it's going to like a super old uh, histor- historied hotel in like deep somewhere in Great Britain, Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure which. So uh, there's actually a pretty good, and I think pretty simple way to resolve this, in my opinion, because there have to be at least two entrances to the hotel (laughs) uh, because of the Ashen Path situation. There's there's sort of literally a back door that's built into into, uh, the house, and it's it's got to be able to receive guests, and it can't really be the front in the way that it would be conventionally because the front has to sort of where the front goes out to has to change, right? As the building changes location, whereas the, the back door entrance, the ashen path entrance is fixed. So I'm going to say that the more intimate style would make sense for the ashen path entrance because it's sort of the, I, I don't think anybody else on this call is as much of an old school doctor who nerd as I am, but uh, the TARDIS, the doctor's vehicle for traveling through time and space, has a control room, um, which is sort of the main body of the TARDIS in most of the contemporary, the, the, the relaunch version. But at one point in the old Doctor Who series, they moved to a different control room for no real reason, except that they wanted to change the set. Um, so it's sort of like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're opening on the f- on the main lobby of the House of Black Lanterns, the main entrance, which is marble and gold and all sorts of complicated detail work. It's quite large and spacious and airy. There's a great deal of light. Of course, it's a slightly ghostly light because all of this is taking place in the shadow fell. So no matter how bright things are, they're always a little bit dimmer than they feel like they should be. But it is the brightness that indicates day. And the bell has just finished tolling, indicating that the house has moved from one location to another. And shortly after the bell finishes ringing, two figures step through the front door of the House of Black Lanterns. They actually have to crouch slightly to get through the door, uh, as they're both roughly uh, each about 12 feet tall. The two uh, men, the two guards on the door, look them over and step aside, apparently having no obvious issue with them. The two figures who've walked in here, uh, as I said, about 12 feet tall, bipeds so you know shoulder span to match 
They are both clad in armor. It looks like some kind of like an ornate lacquered iron plate. One has stark white hair and one has jet black hair. Uh, the one with the white hair, it's mm, scragglier, although they both wear it, their hair long. The, the one with black hair has his hair tied up in a top knot. They have deep green, slightly mottled skin, and each have small horns protruding from their foreheads. The one with white hair has a large mace, spiked mace, hanging from his belt. The one with black hair has a massive curved sword slung over his back. Their breastplates, as I said, the whole armor situation is pretty ornate, but the breastplates have a very prominent design, uh, the same on both of them. It's six circles in three, in sorry, in two columns, so two, two, and two down the front of the chest, and those circles are raised up from the breastplate, and they have a, a square cutout inside each of them. So raised circle, square cut out inside the circle. And the one with the black hair seems to sort of be in the lead. The one with the white hair is kind of following just slightly behind him. And behind that figure is a whole parade of luggage. Um, yeah, of, of like, like uh, chests and uh, baggage. Uh, each one floating individually on some sort of a uh, glowing sigil floating through the air. And the, the, the one with the white hair seems to be sort of like, he's moving his hand in a way that suggests that he's sort of in charge of the baggage train. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, Pix has been uh, kind of hanging around the uh, the front desk, basically, uh, just kind of lounging on top of it. His legs are dangling over the edge. Um, his hands are kind of like holding himself up, and he's making small talk uh, with the uh, person who mans the front desk, or thing that mans the front desk. Uh, he's sort of been wasting away the, the time, kind of waiting for this kind of moment to happen. And as soon as it does, he kind of pushes himself off the the front desk, uh, falls about three feet, uh, lands extremely dexterously with the help of his two small stubby wings, and then kind of in a, in a very professional but almost excited, like hopping, skipping sort of run, um, he makes his way up to those two fellows mm -hmm. and introduces himself. He says, hello there, sirs. He bows deeply. My name is Pix. May I help you with those bags? Greeting them in the common tongue? Yes. Um, the figure with the black hair looks down quite a long ways to get to Pix. You know, mm -hmm. big height differential here. Looks down at Pix, listens, does not directly, does not directly respond, but uh, clears his throat very slightly. And the figure with the white hair, who was a little bit focused on getting the whole baggage train through the door and, and getting everything inside, and now seems to have done so, uh, turns and with... Uh, it's very difficult to read age on these figures. It's, it's... I mean, they have these... Their faces are sort of conventionally terrifying, <laughs> um, but otherwise they don't... It's just hard to say, like, how old are these figures supposed to be? But the, the white-haired figure's movements and reaction in this situation just sort of feel youthful, feel like somebody who's, uh, oh, it's my first day on the job, kind of, um, turns and also looks down at Pix and, uh, like, starts to, like, opens his mouth, uh, starts to say something that Pix definitely doesn't understand, and then starts again and says, uh, thank you. We are the travelers seeking accommodation. Um, uh, well, uh, I can say that you have found 
the finest accommodations this side of the Shadowfell. Come, come. Uh, let's get you checked in and uh, herd you onto your rooms. I'm sure you had a long journey uh, and you'll want to put your feet up. But come this way. Come, come. And he kind of hops and gestures and like ushers them towards the front desk. So uh, the two figures follow Pix to the front desk. For whatever reason, in the time that this has taken, whoever it is who's normally supposed to be in charge of the front desk is nowhere to be found. So you're faced with either trying to find them or checking these two folks in yourself. Pix will certainly check them in himself. This is not the first time, nor will it be the last. The people who run the front desk are always miserable fools. (laughs) And so he kind of leaps up with a couple of, of little wing beats, makes his way to the other side of the, uh, the front desk, tries to find a stool somewhere in the back uh, that he can clamber up on. He kind of pushes it up to, to where the, uh, the guest book is, I guess, um, and clambers up it, um, looks around for a pen, can't seem to find one, remembers that he's got his bell hop cap on. Um, he takes it off and puts it... Uh, gently over to the side. Um, he straightens up his jack a little bit, dusts himself off. Um, he is a dust method. And so uh, he seems to constantly be doing this. It never seems to make any difference. But somehow he doesn't ever get the area around him dirty. He is just always kind of in a state of dustfulness. Uh, so as it like kind of poofs up off his shoulders, it also settles right back down on his shoulders. Uh, he eventually finds his pen, Opens up the gigantic guest book. This thing is uh, probably thousands of pages of very old, old paper. Um, Finds the nearest new entry and says, uh, I assume you didn't have reservations? The the figure with the black hair is sort of calmly, slowly looking around the room, taking things in has produced a scroll from somewhere and appears to be writing on it something, paying really no attention to Pix at this point. But the figure with the white hair says, oh, no, no, we, we, are, we are to be expected. Uh, our, my master tells me that, that there should be a reservation expected uh, for, both, for both of us. Uh, Kian Zhuang is the senior name, and I am... Z Wei Chen. Z Wei Chen. Um, so let me see. Um, uh, Pix kind of looks in the normal reservation book, tries to find the names. Um, does he find anything that looks familiar? Or at least uh, kind of like those names? So the list of reservations is made as the reservations come in. And so there's, you know, two or three maybe, uh, probably... Uh, say uh, six or seven, right? That are sort of upcoming people to be expected. And then you start, you know, go go six or seven backwards and you're just getting into ones that have already happened and they've already been crossed off, right? Okay. So you look at the page. Those names do not appear anywhere on the front page before you start getting into names that have been crossed off. Hmm. Um, are, are you sure it would be under those names? How, how do you spell that? What's the native tongue? For the first time, the figure with the black hair turns, focuses his attention on Pix and speaks. Look in the back. The back? Like the back back? I'll look in the back. He reaches out a very large finger and skips through the pages of whatever notebook holds the reservations. Back, 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 back. To the very beginning of the registry, there are two names written in the characters of the Celestial Imperium, the region of Orth that is far to the west of where Greyhawk and its environs are. Uh, So the character is in a language that Pix doesn't speak, but unlike all of the other names on that page and pretty much all of the pages that he's just flipped through, they are not crossed off. He taps the ledger. Ah, I see. Uh, we are in good company. Um, Pix notices that the name just after theirs 
is his reservation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. Um, and he says, uh, very good, sirs. I will get your room keys ready and make sure that everything is appointed the way it should be for guests such as you. And he goes and finds the room keys that are assigned to them. Um, uh, there's got to be some kind of messaging system here in the House of the Black Lanterns. Mnemonic um, tubes. <laughs> mnemonic tubes? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and whatever it is, he uses it um, so that he doesn't have to... Um, I guess maybe it's a calling system, right? So he can ring a bell of some kind and somebody will come to the front desk and attend to him. It's just like an elaborate network of bells and strings. Yeah, and like they correspond to different types of people who might need the attention of the front desk Mm -hmm. or who the front desk might need the attention of. Um, And so uh, he rings the bell for, uh, I guess, housekeeping to make sure that the room is ready and ready to go. Um, Finds the keys, uh, puts them on the front desk, makes all the notes that he should make. um, But he's definitely noted the fact that uh, these are almost OG people. They've known about the House of Black Lanterns for a very long time. And so their coming must be auspicious in some way. Um, And so he notes that in the back of his head. Um, And he also tries to remember their names. He he makes a note, whatever note system that Pix keeps for himself to sort of keep track of all of his information that he has on the guests. um, This is what he's using right now. Um, Then also in his hat? Possibly in his hat. Also likely in his hat, actually. Um, And uh, so he talks to the housekeeping, makes sure that the room is all ready to go. I assume that it is. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, And he says, uh, here you go, my two fine fellows. Are you going to need help with your luggage to the room? It's kind of a hike. Uh, Ziwei Chang, the figure with the white hair, Mm -hmm. says, no, I have the bags just fine. Thank you. If you could just show us the way. I will be happy to show you the way. Um, Pix looks around for whoever's supposed to be manning the left front desk. Anywhere to be found? No sign. All right. Well, um, he puts back on his bellhop hat, jumps off the stool, kind of moves the stool back to where its original location was. A um, couple flaps of the wings, makes him his way over the front desk again. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, an easy way to get from the front desk to the actual foyer. There's probably some kind of door system that you have to go through to go back, but mm-hmm. he doesn't play by the rules. Um, and uh, he just flies over the desk of the camp. And he affixes his bellhop hat to his head, makes sure that's on tight. And then kind of with a hopping, happy step, uh, makes his way towards where their room is. And makes small talk with him the whole way. Uh, so up the sparkling, wide, sweeping central staircase and then around one of the uh, verandas and then up another set of stairs. Uh, wh- so what sort of small talk does does Pix make? Um, Pix is pointing out, you know, like, oh, this is the lounge. Um, this is the kind of drink you want to be getting here. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure you talk to... Um, the bartender, the Griff bartender, she's a total hoot. A um, lot of fun to talk with. Make sure that um, uh, you avoid ordering this thing at the dining room. Uh, gives them, you know, tips and tricks to kind of maximize their stay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very good. All right. Um, again, Kian Zhuang really doesn't interact with Pix. Seems more focused on whatever he's writing uh, on his scroll after leaving the foyer doesn't seem to pay much attention to the building itself. He's engrossed in whatever it is that he's writing. Uh, but Zi Wei Cheng politely notes what uh, Pix is saying and nods and every once in a while uh, seems to slightly lose control over one of the bags and, and sort of reestablishes <laughs> it. Um, is there any way Pix can get an eyeball on what's on that scroll? Sure. I mean, sort of Pix, I, I, I picture Pix is sort of moving around slightly frenetically, right? Like he's sort a little of bit, yeah. back and forth. And, mm-hmm. um, so he'd have to get some good air because of the, again, the height differential. 
but uh, you know, flapping his wings, he can sort of like pop up and around and circle behind uh, Qian Zhuang and uh, certainly see over the shoulder that Qian Zhuang is writing in that same character system uh, that his reservation was taken in, uh, which I think we've established Pex does not speak. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, fair. Fair. All right. Pex will remember this. Uh, Ziwei Cheng does have a question. Um, when is dinner served? It begins service at 5.30 sharp, um, runs until uh, roughly 8.30. And then, of course, you can always order something to your room, but the, the formal dining room uh, operates during those hours. Very good. I expect my master will take dinner in his room, but um, if you can tell me where the dining room is, I can procure it for him. Yes, um, it is. we do have full service uh, to the dining rooms so 24 hours a day. Uh, whatever you could possibly want, we can find it. We'll get it for you. Uh, but in terms of our formal dining room, it is right down over there by kind of the loungy area, second floor. Um, yeah, in that general direction. By now, you have arrived at a section of hallway that Pix is not sure he can remember having been in before. Um, perfectly nice. Not terribly distinct, has a green and white pattern on the wallpaper. And there are two rooms, uh, both of them with doors tall enough to accommodate 12 foot tall figures. Uh, One of them clearly nicer than the other, however, (laughs) and with uh, nameplates on both of them that match the characters that you saw in the ledger. Well, it looks like we have arrived at your rooms. Can I help you get you settled? Ziwei Chang looks at Qian Zhuang. Qian Zhuang shakes his head, and Ziwei Chang says, That will not be necessary. Thank you. He opens the door for Qian Zhuang. Qian Zhuang walks in. The baggage train follows behind him. And just as it seems like Ziwei Cheng has completely lost all interest uh, or attention uh, for Pix, he sort of perks up, thinks for a moment, and reaches into a pocket in his armor and uh, pulls out a fistful of coins and sort of drops them on to Pix. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, these are coins that match his hands, right? And Pix right. is the size They're that Pix large. is. So, uh, it is possible. I mean, I'm picturing sort of a, a comedy routine where Pix has to take off his cap and try to catch them as they're falling. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. <laughs> yes, they all. Most of them land on the cap. Some of them land on the ground. But Pix does not bother to like go and pick those up. The ones that fell on the ground, he just kind of puts his cap back on his head and kind of toes one of the other coins without looking at it. Um, looks up at. Kianjan Ju Wang and uh, bows and uh, says thank you. Um, and also, with one of his eyes, tries to get a peek into the room. It's not often that he's in a section of the house that uh, he hasn't seen. And so he wants to kind of check out their digs and see how much they're actually spending here. So, um, from the doorway, he can mm-hmm. see that the room is somewhat noteworthy in that it is appointed in a single style. Right, so we've we've talked about how the House of Black Lanterns is sort of this collision of different cultures and architectures and design aesthetics because it it is a thing of the shadow fell, and so the dead of of many different places and times have contributed to it over the years. It doesn't reflect a single style, but this room has a coherence to it. It's a lot of black lacquered wood, bright, vibrant reds. There is a um, a bowl of pomegranates sitting on the table in uh, in the kitchenette area. It looks quite nice um, and uh, you know sort of like it was prepared with a single guest in mind. Cool. All right. It's also like top level room, right? Okay. Like there's definitely there's a variation here. In terms of just apparent size from the doorway alone, this is a executive suite. Okay. And um, so he kind of uh, backs away from them, 
uh, waits for them to close the doors before he leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, at that point, that's when he picks up the rest of the coins, puts them under his hat, and then kind of, he kind of lingers for a little bit, I guess, kind of wondering who they are and what they're paying and why they're here. Um, he also wonders a little bit if he's got some competition. He wasn't able to get a read in terms of what their purpose is. Um, but he, he keeps it all in the back of his head, uh, kind of with a knowing look, and then heads back down to the front desk. Uh, so Zhu Wei Chang actually closes the door with his foot as he's again focused on getting the baggage in place. The coins, uh, by the way, as I said, they are, you know, they're coins of the size that match uh, a, uh, a hand of the the size we're talking about here, right? So they're, they're larger than, Quite large. than yeah. conventional humanoid coins. Um, and they are, uh, they match that image that's on the, both of their breastplates. So they're circular with a small square cutout mm-hmm. uh, in the middle of them. And they have several characters in that language that Pix doesn't speak uh, embossed on them as well. Okay. Good to know. Not that I have any place to spend this. But it's cool. All right. And they're, I mean, Pigs can hang out outside the room for a while if he wants, but there's no further activity from it. Right. All right. Meanwhile, down in the bar area. What's Lizzie up to when there aren't any customers present? Um, a lot of the standard, you know, bar activities, cleaning, a lot of cleaning that goes on I think stocking arranging generally being busy about the place cool okay well while Lizzie is you know cleaning some glasses and refilling the lemons and whatnot and you know uh, like stopping to chat with whatever member of staff happens to wander in mm -hmm. Um, I think during the day the bar is sort of a casual drop in place okay since it's generally patron free then I'm gonna say that Lizzie is just finishing a conversation, a uh, somewhat harried conversation, uh, with Cadewin, the red-haired elf who is the in charge of the kitchens, and you know, coming out from the door behind the bar and saying, "If anyone asks for the lungfish, tell them it's off the menu tonight." I don't think anyone's going to ask for the lungfish, but I'll keep it in mind. Good. Ah, she sort of always seems like that. Just finishing that conversation when two children, maybe eight, nine years old, uh, both wearing somewhat archaic, kind of like children's version of formal wear, uh, walk up to the bar and kind of one of them helps the other onto one stool and then uh, she gives a leg up to him to get him up onto his stool. So there, there are two kids. Uh, they're one boy and one girl. Um, they both have platinum blonde hair, very pale skin, uh, violet eyes, um, apparently human, as far as Lizzie can tell, at least. Um, and they look very similar, like seems like they're probably siblings. Um, and they sit down at the bar and just look at Lizzie. Oh, good. Children of the corn. <laughs> Uh, Lizzie glances down at them, uh, pretty far down because she's six foot ten, uh, mm-hmm. because Lizzie is a gif, which is to say she is a large hippopotamus person. Um, she's about six ten, about 450 pounds, uh, wearing a long skirt and like a, like a peasant blouse under a snug leather vest. Um, what can I get for you? The girl turns to the boy and then looks back at Lizzie and says, my brother would like a glass of milk. And the boy turns and looks at the girl and then looks back at Lizzie and says, my sister would also like a glass of milk. Is cow's milk all right? (laughs) There's a beat and they both answer together. It'll do. She dips under the counter to, I'm going to guess, Icebox. I feel like we can have an Icebox. Why not? Pulls out pitcher. I feel like a pitcher is okay. Um, a pitcher pours two highball glasses of milk. 
places them on the counter. They both say together, thank you. You're quite welcome. Pick up their glasses and with each with both hands and drink. When did you get here? The girl looks at the boy, looks back at Lizzie. My brother and I arrived yesterday. Ah, well, welcome to the House of Black Lanterns. My name's Lizzie Fairweather. I'll be around here at the bar if you ever need me. We have a variety of soft drinks, grand variety of juices. The boy looks at the girl, looks back at Lizzie. My sister would like to know if you stock loquat juice. Mm. We don't have any up here, but I can check down in the cellars. Uh, if you uh, want me to look, or I can uh, have it ready for you next time. Curl looks at Lizzie, says, next time would be very nice. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Are you here on your own? Boy says, no, I'm here with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> suppose I should have seen that coming. <laughs> Are the two of you here by yourselves, or do you have any... Uh, third or fourth parties with you. Girl says, we are here together alone. Well, seems like a lovely other day. The the look that crosses her face is not entirely sincere, um, or maybe not entirely convinced, but it is a polite thing to say. What else is in the bar area? Like, these kids are drinking their milk and looking around. What do they see? Uh, So the bar half of the bar... The lounge is sort of on the other side. Is a lot of dark old wood. Like it looks like it. A lot of it may have been repurposed from something, possibly a ship. Um, there's lights on the walls, you know, like lanterns, and of course a couple of the ubiquitous black lanterns. You know, low tables. It's it's sort of a low room. Mm-hmm. Like Lizzie doesn't have trouble moving around it because. She's used to it and is very professional and also grew up on ships. But another person of her height would probably feel extremely cramped mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as opposed to the lounge on the other side, which is much taller. Um, yeah, other than that, it's and there's the bar, obviously. Uh, there's not a lot of decor. There's probably a couple of actually there's probably a shelf with a few games on it, like uh, chess or whatever they'll. Actually, probably a couple variants of local equivalents of chess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A couple decks of cards, but not a lot in the way of decor. Again, as opposed to the lounge, which I'm picturing is probably much fancier and which probably has outside windows. I feel like the bar is is an internal room. It doesn't have outside light. Okay. Um, kids finish their milks. Girl looks at the boy. Boy hops down off of his stool, goes over to the shelf where the games and the cards are, picks up a deck of cards, comes back uh, over to the bar, and without getting back on the stool, looks up at Lizzie and says, my sister would like to know if we can play here. Of course. Uh, You'll probably be a little more comfortable in terms of space at one of the tables, but you can play on the bar if you'd like. Bar is otherwise empty. They're sort of at a corner, so uh, or they're near a corner rather. So they um, boy helps the girl down from her stool. They go over to a corner of the bar so that they can easily sort of face each other while still sitting at the bar. Help each other up on their respective stools again and start to play uh, some sort of game involving a three dragon anti deck. Mm. I need to know if there's a chimera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh- There's no way that Lizzie would know what's weird in a three dragon anti deck, having seen either none of them or an immense variety of them, depending on how the universe is structured. (laughs) I'm going to say with confidence that she has seen a three dragon anti deck before. Yeah. So she's probably seen enough variety of them that like she's seen variants of play that have different kinds of cards anyway. I am going to say that every, in all of Lizzie's travels, mm-hmm. uh, the card, uh, as we've established, uh, what characters are represented on the cards, like who the local princess is or that sort of thing, that varies wildly. And if, so, of course, she's seen. But the card, the, 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 ascent, the essence of the cards themselves, right, mm-hmm. are always the same. There is no variation in terms of like, oh, you know, some places they have this card and some places they have that. No, 
always the same. This says like this piece is in chess, right? Mm. That doesn't change. Good to know. Still not paying attention. Okay. <laughs> like she's <laughs> she's watching them like just as much as you'd be watching some kids in your place of business, but since there's not really mm-hmm. anything else going on here, and she has sort of an assumption that anyone who is here on their own is capable of keeping an eye on themselves that, you know, she's not super focused on the details of what they're doing. Sure. So the kids are intent on their game, focused, paying attention, uh, otherwise totally silent. Not otherwise. They are totally silent, right? They are not talking to each other. They're not Mm -hmm. laughing or saying things. They're just focused on what's in front of them. The game appears to involve each of them having about half the deck and turning over cards and showing them to each other and then something happens and one of them ends up with the cards. Um, so they're playing three dragon anti-war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the outside perspective is they're playing three dragon anti-war. At some point, uh, the girl ends up with all the cards. They nod to each other. She shuffles the cards up again. They split the decks again. They start over. Uh, but there is no, like, there's no otherwise no, nobody celebrates Nobody gasps, right? There are no reactions. There's just this activity. Mm -hmm. um, And it's otherwise very blank and devoid of emotional information. Is it all right if uh, Pix comes in at this moment? Cool with it, Vin? Fine with me. Uh, So Pix uh, opens the door to the bar. Um, He does his little hoppy, floaty, jumpy, runny, kind of like when he's moving quickly. uh, Gate kind of flies up to Lizzie. Hey, Lizzie, how's it going? How's it going? Well, you know, another day, another coin. <laughs> you're saying you're, 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 you're speaking my language, Lizzie. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, have you seen Cadewin today? Oh, he was here uh, just a few minutes ago. Something about the lungfish, but no one ever orders the lungfish. What, what was his temperature? Was he in a good mood today or a bad mood, would you say? She, by the way. She. Do you mean relatively or for her? Uh, for her. About a three out of five. <laughs> oh, my accent's all over the place. It's okay. It's okay. It's pretty good. <laughs> Way better than anything I ever try. So, fine. Uh, so, Pix kind of takes a deep breath in, does a little calculation in his head, and goes, eh, eh, Yeah, it'll be worth it. Um, and then, uh, Okay, Lizzie, I'll see you around probably next break. Um, I got to go talk to Caitlin. All right, don't bring up the lungfish. She's very touchy about it. Yeah, I won't bring up the monkfish. Thanks for the heads up. And that's it. And then he uh, picks, kind of does his hoppy, jumpy, floaty gait and kind of tr- goes into the kitchen and tries to find Caitlin. Okay. So Pix goes off that direction. Uh, Vin, do you, you have served these kids a drink. Do you want to try and use your drink related ability? Not yet. Okay. That's just fine. So we will cut from there to the lounge. Where, Casey, remind me of your name, character's name? Uh, sh- her name is um, Elodia, Elodia Rarandra. So I think that uh, Elodia has just finished a set. Talk to me about the lounge and Elodia's place in it and how, what you think it looks like when she finishes a performance. Sure. So um, the lounge is kind of another one of those spaces that's very opulent, but kind of doesn't quite know what it wants to be. Angel and exile fall into the shadow. So there's, you know, sort of marble on the floor, but there's these big tapestries kind of position here or there sort of tastefully but a little bit discordant with like the floor itself and there's these gold statues around the perimeter of different um, species of you know from different times and they're all in kind of different positions and the only thing they all have in common is they're each holding a black lantern and so that's sort of the primary illumination for kind of the perimeter of the room, which is a little bit softer and darker and sort of where people sit when they want a little bit more privacy. And then more in the center of the room, there's kind of like a chandelier hanging that more properly kind of illuminates the 
main area and there's a stage in the middle and it's sort of an understated stage it's like a just sort of a little platform with a, a piano and you know a place that's a little bit enchanted so if you stand there your voice projects a little bit better than you know it might anywhere else um and similarly the the piano is similarly enchanted uh and there's you know usually someone playing and and when Elodie is performing she's usually kind of you know leaning gracefully up against the piano or moving around it um occasionally she plays herself but most of the time she she has a pianist that you know performs with her um she is uh an eladrin eladrin i, I say eladrin but i'm not sure if there's a i say eladrin so he right is all there you and go. He washes out remind me in D are the elves tall or short tall okay so she's uh, not as tall as Lizzie, but I'd say she's probably around like six feet, six two. Very kind of a long, elegant figure. Uh, she has hair that's sort of this uh, ombre of like sunset colors. So, you know, reds and uh, a little bit of violet and, and golds and um, oranges. And when it's down, it's kind of it kind of all fades from one down to the next. But she always has it up in sort of an elaborate uh pile of so it was always sort of this uh, swirl of colors that don't quite uh that just sort of you know dazzling um and she's always in some kind of evening gown when she's performing of, of the sort that like she could be going up on stage or she could be just you know a guest that's just very well dressed for the for the lounge um and her evening gowns tend to vary in again in kind of culture they're you know they're all like high formal but they're they have a different aesthetic every night. So tonight she happens to be wearing one from the same um, place in the world that uh, the two, the dark haired and, and white haired guests are from. Mm-hmm. So she's kind of in sort of, you know, I'm going to guess sort of flowing more like, you know, wide uh, sleeved kind of kind of deal um, that also sort of complements her, the color of her hair. So like a sort of a deep red with like gold accents. Um, and so she's kind of stepping away from the piano and the, the piano player is kind of taking a moment to, he's probably going to head over to the bar to get something to drink. Um, and she kind of just, you know, circles the lounge and starts to see, uh, if anyone who is listening, you know, wants to speak to her or, um, needs anything or anything like that. So, uh, the audience is is relatively small. Uh, this was like an afternoon performance. Right? Things haven't really gotten going yet. Right. Um, not a commentary on her popularity at all. Just this is like the matinee crowd, right? Right. Uh, it's mostly ghosts. Um, <laughs> some some faces that she recognizes. They've been here for a few days. Some faces that are maybe new. Uh, but one of those ghosts in particular... Uh, you know, raises his glass after the applause have died down and she's stepped off of the stage. He raises his glass and um, that way that indicates a patron, uh, A, better appointed than a lot of the other uh, ghosts are and uh, drinking some sort of otherworldly scotch that looks expensive and suggests that he'd like to talk to her. Do ghosts look like see through y or like how do you know? That you're yeah, dealing with a like, ghost when you're in the shadow film. It looks slightly translucent. Um, not like hugely different, but yeah, you can tell visually when you're talking to a ghost, usually. Okay. She the matinees are usually like classics because it's it's almost always ghosts. So she, you know, drifts over and um smiles at the the ghost with the the scotch and uh says, Did you enjoy the performance? At the table, of course, she recognizes the scotch. This is a person who's been here for a little while, not a super long time or not a full on resident, but, you know, a ghost who's been hanging around and, and longer than most of the ghosts do. Because while they get a lot of different people at the end of the Black, at the House of Black Lanterns and some people stay for a short time, some people stay for a long time, the ghosts tend to be passing through. Mm-hmm. Most of them are on their way to Lithurnia, to the, the place that all the ghosts sort of when you die in the real world, you pass into the shadow of fell. And in, except in very unusual cases, um, your purpose in passing through the Shadow Fell is to get to Laternia, which is the sort of nexus of all of the spirits that are looking to pass on to the next life. Um, and that's where they all get sorted there. So, like, everybody's just sort of making their way there. And 
maybe they stop for a night or two, but then they continue on their way. They're, they're travelers with one particular goal in mind. But this guy has been staying around for a while. And so um, the slightly handsome, but definitely thinks he's more handsome than he is, uh, ghost in, in nice robes, drinking his expensive scotch, worn star coat, says, <laughs> Of course it is. Elodia, I always enjoy your performances. Must be what keeps you here so long. Well, among other things, he swirls his scotch <laughs> with a rakish air and sips it <laughs> knowingly. Right. Um, does he like, is it typical that he kind of chit chats with her? Or this is yeah. different. No, okay. this is, this is very typical. This is okay. him on your average afternoon. This dude does not appear to have anything to do other than drink expensively and hang out in the lounge. He does. Okay. He seems to legitimately enjoy her performances. So she's going to kind of just offer him a warm smile and kind of prepare to move on. Cause she mm-hmm. assumes that's sort of their, like their afternoon exchange and, yeah. you know, job well done. As she's about to move away from his table, he says, that's a very striking gown you're wearing. Oh, well, thank you very much. It seemed the right day for it. He, um, it almost looks like he winks. Not quite. It, it, the eye doesn't fully close. But, but something <laughs> so approaches. Like, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Like, like twitch, but try to look cool about it. Right. And, uh, he says, ah, very interesting day indeed, then. Isn't it always, though? <laughs> All right. He's not going to stop you from moving on. Okay, so she's also going to make her way to the bar mm-hmm. to get um, a little something to drink, mostly to kind of just, you know, give her throat a break. Okay. Kids are, as, as you, you heard the previous scene, mm-hmm. so the kids are yeah. still playing cards at the bar. No other patrons over here at the moment. Ellie, what can I get for you? Oh, it's just the usual, just a, a tea with lemon and honey, please. That's it this week for the Chimera. Our theme music is Hoof, Heart, and Hiss by Matt Weber. You can find a link to more of Matt's work and any other music used in this episode in the show notes. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash chimeropod or by leaving us a rating on your favorite podcast app or just by telling a friend. We'll be back with a new episode in two weeks, but if you want to see what we're up to in the meantime, you can find us online at thechimera.space or on Twitter or Facebook at Chimeropod. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.